and welcome to our last week of big data here. We've got uh, one more topic that we'll be covering today. This will be our last sort of topic of things that will be on the final exam and things that will help you with uh, the project that is due at the end of the week. And then um, on Wednesday, it'll be essentially like a review day, recap everything that we've talked about and um, a chance for you all to ask questions about things that you uh, want to know more about for, for the final exam. Um, again, the final exam, the format is going to be that you'll have all the finals week to work on it and I'll give you the exam on Monday, um, post it on GitHub then. And as soon as the exam has been uh, posted, I'm not gonna be able to answer really any questions about the class anymore. So if you do have questions, uh, things that could be on the final exam that you want answered, then Wednesday and Friday would be the, the two main opportunities to uh, get those answered. So before we start on the last material for today, are there any, I guess, administrative questions about anything for the end of end of the course. Okay, then let me share my screen here. And yeah, so I'm on our GitHub uh, repo right now, week 14, and in um, I guess the title again, roll-up tables and probabilistic data structures. So we're gonna talk about each of these just a little bit today, just enough to kind of give you the uh, sort of the flavor of, of what these two topics are about. And both of these are active areas of research right now, both for the sort of like Postgres specific community and the big data community more broadly. Uh, what we're gonna talk about today, it'll be, let's see, the first roughly, 40, 50 minutes of class or so is gonna be focused on motivation about like why we care about these two topics. And then at the end of class today, maybe the last 10 to 15 minutes or so, we'll be talking about the specific questions for the final exam that'll be related to these topics. Um, so there's yeah, one, one last set of uh, material that you'll need to know for the final exam and we'll uh, should get to that today but it'll be at the very end. Okay, so last time, let's see, on this, on this webpage, it's divided up into three little problems and solutions. And last time we talked about this first problem. And in particular, what this problem is that when you do this count star in Postgres and any sort of uh, database engine actually, it's going to be a lot slower than maybe you think it should be in some situations. And here's a particular example from Instagram where they were using count star, this query right here, to calculate this number right here, the number of likes on the web page. And the count star, when you run that query, it actually has to do the counting. Um, even if you have an index, no matter what you do, if you run this query, it actually has to uh, do all that counting. There's a big for loop one by one. And so as Instagram was getting a lot of likes, in this case, 1.2 million on this just one post right here, then that's a lot of uh, iterations through a for loop that has to happen every time somebody visits this web page, slowing it down considerably. And for a website like Instagram, that's a sort of a double problem because if a, uh, a page has a lot of likes, it also means that there's gonna be a lot of people visiting that page. So you um, they sort of hit that slow down penalty twice. And so our idea, idea for uh, fixing that is to just cache this value and so that we don't have to recompute it each time. And Instagram uses this uh, system called memcache uh, to, to do that caching. Again, this is, uh, memcache has existed since about 2000. And uh, at the time, Postgres didn't have something built in that could do caching like this for you, but now Postgres does. And so uh, this built-in caching mechanism called the materialized view would be the more standard solution now. So you don't have to maintain two separate databases at once. This, uh, let's see, either solution, whether you're using memcache or Postgres's built-in materialized views, 
still has another problem though. And that's that when you update this cache, you actually have to recompute the entire query from scratch. This is not a, let's see, there are some theoretical ways to avoid this recomputation, which we'll talk about. But at, at the moment, uh, they're not implemented in any database system, uh, just for, for practical engineering sort of reasons. And so we'll talk about real quick how to use these materialized views. And then we'll talk about some of these um, theor theoretical ways to uh, make them faster, even faster. So creating the materialized view uses a command of this form right here. It's just like a regular view where we have up here declaring it, giving it a name, and then inside here is the actual uh, query that we want to have cached for us. So in this case, it's another count star query. And just adding this word materialized here means that Postgres, rather than computing this every time that you access it, if it was just a regular view, then anytime we did a select from count view, it would actually recompute this whole query. But because it's materialized, it's actually storing this on your hard drive, and so it can just access it in O of one time instead of O of n time. Um, yeah, so you could access it, for example, like this. And then every time you want to refresh the view, get newer uh, results, you issue this command right here, refresh materialized view, and it updates those results, uh, recomputes the values. So um, yeah, but again, this problem is that this command right here is now the expensive one. And so how can we uh, fix that? And this is where these roll up, this idea of a roll up table comes in. So roll up tables are a technique for uh, sort of incrementally updating these materialized views. In a materialized view like this, where we have a count that we're trying to uh, store, it's sort of intuitively obvious how we could update that incrementally. Just any time there is a new insertion into this table, let's just add one to whatever count value that we're storing. Um, there's not really any, any sort of magic going on there. It's just a matter of implementing that in a way that, that it can work. The Oracle database currently has a sort of ad hoc system for doing that that works with a, a couple of different things, um, but it's not, not very general purpose. In Postgres, people generally um, sort of at this, currently what uh, standard practice is, is to write these things by hand. And uh, there's a lot of articles uh, online about how to do this. Uh, we're not gonna look at the details of what that looks like, but typically you'd be writing about a thousand or so lines of uh, complex SQL code uh, that, that would implement this for you. Um, that would basically just add one to this value right here every time you insert into this table. Instead, we'll talk about this other, uh, and again, at a real high level, this other extension right here, PG Rollup. And um, this is an extension that sort of is able to do all of that for you automatically. And the way it does that is, or the technique that it's using to do that is a technique from abstract algebra uh, called monoids and monoid homomorphisms. So uh, these, yeah, I have the formal definitions of what a monoid is and what a monoid homomorphism is down here. I'll, I'll review what those formal definitions are, but uh, unless you're like a, a hardcore math person, the formal definitions are probably not going to give you the sort of real intuition for what's going on here. And so after talking about the, the formal definitions really briefly, we'll take a look at the intuition. And the intuition part is really the part to, uh, to try to understand. Uh, okay, so a, mon a monoid is a set X with an associative binary operation, uh, which I'm calling off right here. And uh, so here, x1, x2, and x3 are elements of this set x. So they could be numbers, they could be strings, they could be, uh, they could be anything. And this op function, so it's a binary operation, so it takes in two parameters, 
and it outputs some other um, some other value in x. And because this operation is associative, we have that if you do combine x2 and x3 first, and then combine x1, that's the same as first combining x1 and x2, and then combining x3. So associativity turns out to be a really nice property for uh, computing systems. And uh, it also turns out to be a very common property with a lot of things that we want to compute. Um, so here are just some quick examples that if you have x as, say, like the set of all sets, um, modulo the, uh, the weird recursive um, sets that would give you uh, paradoxes and uh, the union operation, then that is a, a monoid. Sometimes you would hear people talk about this particular monoid as the free monoid. Um, SQL tables, so this would be closely related. If you're just combining SQL tables, concatenating them together, basically unioning them together, um, union is the specific SQL command for doing that, then that is also an associative operation. If you have integers and you add them together, then that addition is associative, uh, but max is also associative. So one of the things to take away from this example is that the operation, you can have the same operation on sort of different objects. And you can have different objects using, or you can have the same object that uses different operations. And you have to sort of specify exactly what is the, the set and what is the thing that you're doing on it. Very often when people are uh, talking about monoids, they will call this operation plus. Uh, just because integers with addition is sort of like the, the standard thing to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, let's see, I'll keep going on through this uh, formal definition, then we'll go to the, uh, the intuition about how this applies in this use case, and uh, then I'll stop and ask for if there's any questions about this. So the, the monoid by itself isn't going to be uh, super useful to us. What we need is this monoid and this idea of a homomorphism. Um, for those of you that have taken linear algebra, so it's not strictly a prereq for this class, um, but uh, the thing to think about for a, a homomorphism is like a linear function. A homomorphism is like a linear function for monoids that preserves all of the operations of the monoid structure and a linear operation preserves all of the structure of the vector structure. Uh, so here's the sort of particular formula of what that looks like, is that if our function here f is a homomorphism, and we'd say it's, in this case, a homomorphism from sets or SQL tables into, say, integers, um, then it doesn't matter whether we first say combine our data sets like this, and then apply our function. Or if we first apply our function, get the results, and then use our monoid operation, our combining operation to merge those two things together. It doesn't matter, we'll get the same result. And this is the key property that's going to let us do uh, sort of all sorts of cool computational tricks. That we can do things in any order and we'll still get the same result. So some key examples are this count operation above is a monoid homomorphism. And it doesn't matter whether you first combine your data set and then count, or if you first count like this and then add those two things together, you'll still get the, the same result in the end. Similarly with uh, uh, if you first combine and then take them in, or first take them in, and then now our combining would be taking the min of these two minimums rather than adding them together. Averaging is a little bit more uh, complicated of a formula to do that you have to do a weighted average in this operation right here. If you take the weighted average of these two things right here, that'd be the same as the average of this thing right here. And similarly, standard deviation variance has a weighted formula that you can use. Uh, but the formula is a lot more complicated than weighted average, so I didn't bother to write it out. The, um, let's see, the, I think the, 
And I'll get into some of the intuition about this. The main intuition that I like to think of is that MapReduce, so this thing that we kind of started the class with, talking about with Twitter, uh, it really only works when uh, you're working with a monoid homomorphism. So when your reduce is one of these monoid operations, and when your map function is one of these Fs. So in the uh, Twitter example that, uh, that we did for the, the map reduce, your, your map function was just counting the number of tweets that happened on a particular time interval. And then your reduce function was just adding those numbers together. And um, let's see if we come over here. So here's our, say, our data set. It didn't matter like how we partitioned the data into different chunks like this, and then uh, which order we ended up combining things together in. Because the count and the plus is a monoid homomorphism, uh, we can partition things however we want. And then as long as we do the mapping with that f function and reducing its associative, so it doesn't matter the order, we're, gonna, we're guaranteed to get the same results. Um, so that's sort of the, the intuition about these like monoid homomorphisms about um, why uh, why they're useful computationally is that it doesn't matter how you split up your data set because it's associative you're going to get the same results in the end so for our uh, twitter assignment again we did just counting the the number of tweets satisfying some criteria but we could have say um, what's the minimum number of tweets sent in a day or the max sent in an hour or the average number. And because all of these functions are monotomomorphisms, uh, they would have worked just fine with MapReduce. The way this comes up in these uh, roll-up tables is that um, you can actually automatically generate a roll-up table or automatically update your materialized view anytime the function in the materialized view is one of these homomorphisms. So when you have a count, a min, a max, an average, a standard deviation, if your, um, if your materialized view is of that form, so here we have our, our monoid homomorphism right here, this count function. Because it's a count function, it's theoretically possible to, uh, to update it and not recompute it from scratch. And this, this extension, PG Rollup, does that for you automatically. Switch over to um, code real quick. So here I'm looking at the search engine folder and opening up the schema.sql file right here in Vim. And let's see, here we go. So here's that PG rollup extension being loaded up. And then if I do a search, so I'm just gonna search for materialized. And you can see that there's a handful of these uh, materialized views in here. And these are all sort of able to be uh, incremented for us automatically. We don't have to do any of this manual refreshing. We don't have to um, do all of these uh, counts every time somebody visits our webpage. Um, because it's being cached here and it's being cached efficiently. These uh, queries, or sorry, these tables, these views are the views that you have to uh, access in your, um, uh, when you're submitting the, the web page or submitting your assignment and up, uploading the queries to uh, GitHub. Some of those, all of those views are, or all of those queries are based on these materials materialized views. Um, these views right here as well are used inside of the web page to actually return the, the results efficiently in just constant time. Um, let's see, that's a, a pretty high level overview of um, this concept. The main thing for, for you to take away is that um, just that there is this word monoid homomorphism. You'll hear people talk about it occasionally in the context of uh, parallel and distributed computing. And it um, also has this relationship to MapReduce and to these uh, roll-up tables. 
Um, at this point, we haven't talked about the like concrete things that you need to know for the final exam, the questions for that. Uh, there actually won't be any concrete questions on the final related to this. Instead, this is still part of the motivation that's gonna lead us into that third problem, uh, which we'll talk about next, which will have the concrete questions for the final exam. Uh, but before we go on to that third problem, are there any questions about, about this section of material? Okay, so this problem three, what do we do when we get a situation where the thing we want to compute is not a monoid homomorphism? So in particular, count distinct. This function right here is not a monoid homomorphism. So if we were um, back in this diagram right here, if we wanted to say, rather than counting the total number of tweets in one of our partitions, but count the uh, number of distinct users who have sent a tweet, then we can easily count the number of distinct users inside just one of these individual partitions. But what happens if the same user over here is contained in multiple partitions? When we add those results together at the end, we'll be double counting those users. So again, if say I have sent a tweet that's in this data set right here, and I've sent a tweet that's in da this data set right here, then when we add just the total number of users from both data sets together, um, I'll be included twice because I was in this one over here and in this one over here. So we need some way to prevent that from happening. There's this really cool data structure called the hyperlog log, which is what we'll talk about for uh, doing this. The hyperlog log data structure. Uh, it turns out that this is a monoid. The hyperlog log data structure is a monoid. And the function that computes the hyperlog log data structure is a monoid homomorphism. This uh, data structure is used to approximate the count distinct function. So it won't give us exact answers, but we can see that well, what we will see is that you can get arbitrarily close approximations. So if I need answers that are, say, within 10%, I can do that. If I need 1%, I can do that. If I need 0.1%, I can do that as well. You just have to specify in advance how accurate you want your uh, counts to be. A lot of people have called this the sort of most important data structure uh, in big data. I would say it's, um, let's see. Every website on the internet, at least every database backed website, is using B trees in some sense, in some part of the back end. The vast majority of them are also going to be using hyperlog logs. Um, so it's not quite as ubiquitous as the B tree, but it is uh, very, very close. And um, yeah, because of the things that it can do, uh, in some sense, it's more important than a B tree. For, for certain applications, we'd rather have this than a B-tree if we could only pick one. The original papers from 2007, uh, we'll take a look at just a part of this here in a second. And then there's a uh, Postgres implementation right here. And for your, um, uh, for the final exam questions, we'll, you'll have to be able to reference certain parts of this and, and we'll see how to do that here in a second. Um, yeah, so because it's a monoid homomorphism, it has applications both in rollup tables, which require that we have monoid homomorphisms to update efficiently, and in MapReduce, which requires that we have, uh, that our map function is a monoid homomorphism in order to use it. So uh, you can use this sort of data structure in either location. Well, talk about the details of this data structure in a second here. Um, but uh, uh, first, I want to highlight that there are other similar data structures that we won't be talking about. So here, hyperlog log, again, is for counting distinct amounts. If we wanted to, say, take the median of a, um, of a, of a data set, the median, unlike the average, is not a monoid homomorphism. And so you cannot sort of map reduce it and you cannot um, do a roll up table on it. There are, however, two good uh, data structures, the t-digest and the KLL, 
which are similar to the hyperlog log, but for approximating the median. And it looks like I have a formatting typo right here, but um, there are also similarly good data structures for calculating the mode of a data set. So the count min sketch and the top k data structure. And essentially any sort of statistic that you might want to calculate about a uh, data set, there is probably going to be a, uh, a data set like this that will um, sort of be able to approximate it in this monoid form. Um, okay, so what we're going to do next is we will take a look at how this data structure actually works. And um, yeah, I think it's one of the sort of really, I don't know, I think it's really cool. It's going to be something that you'll feel like, like it, it totally makes sense once you see it explained. It's not really that that hard, the, the basic idea. Um, but it's one of those things like, how would you ever come up with that in the first place? Um, let's see, before we talk about the, uh, the details of what's going on under the hood, are there any questions about the motivation for, for this data structure or what it does? Okay. And so this part here is going to be one of the parts that you'll really have to understand well in order to answer these questions that will appear on the final exam. So I'm going to uh, just write out a quick example of a small data set. So our data set is going to have a bunch of words inside of it. So we'll say hello world and then goodbye world like this and so the count here it's four different elements in our data set but the distinct count there's just three distinct elements And I'm using individual words right here, but our data set could have, um, could be numbers, could be uh, full documents. Um, the actual type of this data doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter at all. And the first thing that we do with our data set is we hash it. Let's do red. So we'll hash it, and I'll write out some example hashes in particular in, in binary. So again, a hash function is just a, a way of converting whatever your data set over here is into a essentially random number. And um, it's, these hash functions aren't typically written out in binary necessarily, but um, it'll be important for us to see these in binary, so that's why I'm writing it in binary. And the numbers that I'm writing here are uh, just numbers that I've made up. Zero, one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero. And in particular, they are, um, I'm just writing out uh, eight bits of a, of a hash function like this. So each bit is gonna be zero or one. And depending on the particular hash function you use, you'll get very different, um, very different values here. Zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one. We're missing a one at the end of this. So I think all of those have, um, have eight bits inside of them. And then, yeah. Hello corresponds to that, world corresponds to that, goodbye here, world here. And you'll notice that all of the distinct words have different hash values, but because world and world are the same word, their hash values are the same thing. So um, the first key idea, which is a relatively straightforward idea, is that once we do this hashing, we don't need the data set anymore. We can just look at these hash values in order to check whether two things are distinct. If the hashes are different, then, uh, then they're distinct.
The next observation is the sort of the key observation and the um, kind of, yeah, the key step, the key, the key insight of this hyperlog log algorithm. And that's that if each of these bits is sort of in some sense random, so if each bit is random, and I have random here in scare quotes because again, hash functions aren't truly random in any sort of philosophical sense of the word random, that they're a deterministic mapping from uh, the thing on the left to this number here. But the properties of a good hash function is that a very small change in our um, input over here will have a large change in our results over here, and that large change will be unpredictable. So we're basically assuming that the bits are, um, uh, so 50% 0, 50% 1, and that each bit is independent of every other bit. sometimes abbreviated as IID, independent and identically distributed. And then so under these two assumptions right here, then uh, what we'd have is that one half of all hash values have uh, exactly one zero up front. Uh, zero out in front. And then a quarter will have zero zero out in front. An eighth will have zero zero zero. One sixteenth will have zero, 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 zero. Basically, every time you add a new zero, because there's a 50% chance of being zero, you multiply the number of items that actually have that at, by one half. And so in general, one over two to the n, you'll have n zeros out in front. And these numbers over here are um, assuming that we have a very large amount of hash values in our, in our data set. It'll follow this sort of distributional law. Uh, we could formalize this a little bit more saying that uh, as in the number of uh, samples goes to infinity, it'll be the expectation that satisfies this. Um, but we don't we don't really need to be super formal about it, just as long as this idea kind of makes sense that as you um, expect to have, uh, or as you get more and more zeros out in front, you get rarer and rarer by a factor of two each time. That's the key, key insight. If we come back up to our small sample data set up here, then uh, how I wrote out these hash values before, you can see that um, here, it, it doesn't exactly follow that uh, distribution, that we have three, three values with, um, with zeros out in front, and then with one zero out in front, and then two values with two zeros out in front. But there's no, nothing with, say, like 10 zeros out in front. We'd have to be really unlucky to just get zero, 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 zero. Are there any questions about this part so far? This sort of key observation? Okay. So based on this idea, we can say that our claim, and this will be an informally stated claim rather than a theorem, is that for a 
data sets with two to the n distinct elements. Then the most or the um, the element with the most number of leading zeros or the hash value with the most leading zeros will probably, I'll put this in scare quotes here, have n zeros. And again, this could be a little bit, or the way that this would be formalized a little bit more is that this probably, we could specify a particular probability as a function of the data set size, or um, say that in expectation, it will be n zeros. Um, uh, we'll see exactly what that looks like. We'll take a look at the, the actual theorem in a minute in the paper. Um, but really that sort of uh, formality, I think, obscures the intuition here. Um, the intuition is just that as you double the size of the data set, you're probably going to have uh, just one more item with one more leading zero. And so in order to, based on this claim, in order to get a good estimate of how our how many distinct elements elements we have in our data set, uh, in order to estimate the count distinct, all we have to do is keep track of how, what's the biggest number of leading zeros that we've seen so far? Just keep track of the largest leading zeros. And so by largest leading zeros, I mean that you'll see one data point at a time uh, iterating through the data set and you just have a single number that you're counting and I'll scroll up here so that we can see it. But at this point, our counter, uh, the leading zeros counter For the very first one, it'll be zero. And then here, it'll be two. Here, we have one leading zero that's less than two, so it'll stay at two. And then remains two like this, two. And then our estimate for how many distinct items we have in here is uh, two raised to the power of whatever our leading counter number is right here. So call this number, um, uh, r equals 2, and then 2 to the r equals 2 squared equals 4. And so in this case, we don't actually have exactly four distinct elements in our data set. We actually have three elements in our data set, but 4 is very close to 3. And so we have um, a good estimate of the number of distinct items that we have here. And all we had to do was do a single for loop through the data set in order to get this estimate. For a very small data set like this, this is probably not the correct technique to do. Uh, you can just, the simpler thing to do is just sort it and then uh, iterate through counting one at a time that way. But this counting of the leading zeros is uh, going to be a lot more space efficient and a lot more computationally efficient on the, the much larger data sets. We'll also see that this is going to be a monoid homomorphism, which means you can trivially parallelize it with MapReduce and do these roll-up tables with it. Um, are there any questions about the, the basic idea of this algorithm so far, counting the leading number of zeros and how that translates into an estimate of the number of items that we've seen?
Okay. Let's see. So hopefully you can, um, like this might make sense to you, but you see that there might be some problems with it. So two possible problems are the first and sort of, I guess, most obvious is that there's just a lot of randomness involved in this. And uh, it's very possible that we just get really unlucky with um, our first uh, element that we encounter, and it just happens to say be all zeros. And now our estimate is, is, is thrown way off. Um, if we have a hash function that's not carefully designed, then a malicious attacker could even say carefully construct an item, put it into our data set that hashes to something that contains a lot of zeros and throws off our, our estimates. Um, so we're at this point vulnerable to this sort of randomness. Um, we also have a second problem where um, all our estimates have to be a power of two at this point. So we said that the way that we're estimating the size, the cardinality of our data set, the number of distinct elements inside of our data set is that we have this counter that I was calling R up here. And we just uh, raise that to the power of two and that's our estimate of the number of distinct elements in the data set. And because this number here must be an integer, then you're guaranteed to be 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, you can't get anything in between the power of 2. So you'll never get an estimate of like 211 because that's not a power of 2. And so that means that our estimates are in some sense very limited in the amount of even the best case scenario what their accuracy can be. Um, that essentially like 50% accuracy is the best that we can do because something could be right in the middle of this power of 2. So there's um, a relatively easy way to fix both of these problems at the same time. And they have the same fix. So the fix is don't use one hash function. use m different hash functions. And uh, we're going to go look at the documentation of the Postgres library here in a second. But when we do, we'll see that a typical value for m for m would be uh, 2 to the 11th. That's their default value. So 2 to the 11th is a, uh, is a mental math powers of 2 that's really easy to do. Um, so that's 2 to the 10th times 2. 2 to the 10th is 1024, so about 1,000. So that's 1,000 right here times 2. So that's approximately 2,000 different uh, hash functions that we're using. For each of these hash functions, we'll need to store a separate counter. For each hash. And in hyperlog log language, each of these counters is called a register. the register. And so this m value right up here, this m is also equal to the number of registers that we're storing for the hyperlog log. Number of registers that we have to store. 
And then with each of these uh, registers, the way the, the name hyper log log comes into play is the final results or the final estimate is the hyperbolic mean the hyperbolic mean of the registers. Um, and so this solves, ends up solving both of our problems that we had before. First, the randomness problem that uh, even if you have a hash function that uh, or if, if you have a data set that performs really badly on one hash function, gets a lot of zeros in the, uh, the leading uh, bits. Well, because you have so many hash, different hash functions, um, you can actually guarantee that you can't be bad for all of those hash functions at the same time, assuming you have a set of very carefully constructed hash functions. Um, so that eliminates a lot of the randomness from the um, uh, from the algorithm. This hyperbolic mean instead of an ordinary mean actually also turns out to eliminate a lot of the randomness. It turns out before there was a hyper log log data structure, there was just a log log data structure and the log log data structure used an ordinary arithmetic mean to do the averaging here. And uh, we'll see here in a second when we take a look at the paper that um, that just got worse performance, worse accuracy. The hyperbolic mean actually reduces the variance of our estimates. The fact that we have so many different estimates that we're combining together now also uh, fixes the second problem, fixes the fact for, that our estimates no longer have to be a power of two because we are, um, each individual register will be a power of two, but when we average them together, we'll get, uh, in ranges inside of that power of two, and so they'll no longer be um, restricted just to powers of two. So this one simple fix, one simple addition, fixes both of those two problems for us. Are there any questions about this so far? Okay, we're gonna come back to these uh, handwritten notes here in a second, but first I wanna take a look at this, uh, the actual hyper log log paper itself. So you can see it was first, uh, uh, the paper was introduced in 2007, and I wanna scroll down to, first of all, this table right here, where they compare their algorithm hyperlog log against some of the previous competing algorithms that also calculate this uh, distinct uh, count distinct property. And um, uh, yeah, it's not showing the, the years here, um, but so the earliest ones are from about 2000 and then uh, hyperlog log came out pretty much just before hyperlog log. And um, again, the only difference is using the hyperbolic mean instead of the arithmetic mean. These other techniques up here use totally different techniques. Since hyperlog log came out, there's been an additional sort of uh, dozen or so papers that build off of this, adding more slight twists on it, um, but they're essentially the same thing, just very slight differences. We haven't talked about the cost, how many bytes or how many bits our algorithm is actually gonna use, but we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, but here you can see that it's using the smallest amount of memory, that each one of these uh, M here is the number of registers uh, that we have. And uh, the standard for um, uh, hyperlog log is five bits per register. The other ones use a little bit more bits per, per register. And this is the actual accuracy uh, value that they get. So as you add more registers, again, M is the number of registers, your accuracy is, uh, or the, um, and uh, maybe slightly more 
technically correct word is your standard error, the variance of your estimate is going to decrease. This will approach zero. Uh, if you were perfectly accurate, then this number here would be zero. So adding more registers increases your accuracy. This rate of something divided by the square root of the number, this is sort of the standard optimal rate that you can get anytime you have any sort of estimation going on. Um, the uh, theoretical ideal for this would be one divided by square root of n. So it's very, very close to, to optimal here. Uh, the other thing that I wanted us to see was here's the full statement of their uh, theorem. This is the formal version of that claim that I made. And you can see there's just a lot of sort of stuff going on here, a lot of details. And the, um, the, actual, the actual details are sort of not really important, but not important at all from a practical perspective. And even from a theoretical perspective, these are the sorts of things that people would essentially just uh, gloss over. Um, in order to fully understand the details of uh, just exactly what this theorem is uh, stating and the proof of this uh, theorem, this would be like a uh, something that you would talk about in say a second or third semester graduate level algorithms course. Uh, so it's uh, fairly fairly involved and, and so not something we're, we'll cover in detail here. Um, yeah, the, the paper itself is 20 pages and if we were to look at it, it's just full of these fairly detailed involved math equations going through and actually uh, proving that this use of registers and the use of the hyperbolic mean is going to give you uh, really good counts. But this is the all of the intuition. Um, let's see, the last thing for us to talk about here is the actual number of, let's be a little bit more careful about the number of bits or the number of bytes and amount of space that one of these hyperlog log data structures is going to consume. So we said that there's going to be M registers. And so our total amount of disk space disk usage, or memory usage, RAM usage, wherever you're storing this, will be M, the number of registers, times the number of bits that you use per register. And um, this is the part of the lecture to uh, really start paying attention and focusing if you've um, the stuff before has been maybe a little bit abstract and not uh, not everything's fully sticking. That's that's okay. You won't be tested on the stuff that's happened previously. That's really for the motivation about this part right now about what we care about. What we're going to talk about now is the different parameters to this hyperlog log and how you tune it in order to trade off between your disk usage and your accuracy. And this is something that you'll have actual questions on, on the, on the final exam. And so this is the part to, um, to really make sure that you understand. So the disk usage, M, the number of registers times the number of bits per register. Both of these two values right here are what I would call hyperparameters. Which means things that the user must specify. Since I come from a, or this, this word hyperparameters is uh, a word used often in machine learning as a synonym for things the user must specify. Um, and in a machine learning sense, uh, parameters without the hyper are things that the, uh, the algorithm learns for us automatically. Uh, so this word hyper right here is not related to the fact that hyperlog log has the word hyper in it. This is just a machine learning terminology. You'll see people referring to both of these values right here as either hyperparameters or regular parameters, just parameters by itself. 
and um, based on like which vocabulary word people use, I can tell what their sort of academic or industry background is. If they're a machine learning oriented person like I am, then they'll use the word hyperparameters to describe this information. If they are a, um, I guess basically anybody else, they might use just the word parameters or inputs or uh, something like that. And um, so yeah, we've seen how M affects uh, our accuracy a little bit, that the larger M is, the more accurate we can be. Let's talk about this bits per register now. And for the bits per register, what's important is what is the largest number that we can store? What's the largest number of leading zeros that we can count? Because the largest number of leading zeros we count gives us an upper bound on the maximum number of distinct elements that we can um, that we that we can actually count. Um, so, if, for example, we only were storing one bit per register, then that means we can either just identify whether there's only zero or one leading zeros. That's not very much. The typical recommendation here is five bits per register. Five bits per register, so five bits uh, corresponds to two to the fifth equals 32, 32. And so 32 up to 32 leading zeros in the hash function. With 32 leading zeros, that's, um, oh, uh, let's see. So uh, two to the 32, would be the maximum number of distinct elements that we could count. That's two to the 10 cubed times two times two. Again, two to the 10 is a thousand. So that's a billion right here times four. So that's about four times 10 to the ninth is uh, about the biggest thing that we can count. Uh, the biggest set that we can count with five bits per register. If your set is not going to have more than about a billion elements in it, then you can use five bits per register. But if you needed more, um, if you were expecting to potentially have more unique things than this, then you might need to store six bits per register or seven bits per register. And you can uh, easily count how many uh, items that that'll be able to take. How did you get from the five bits per register to 32 zeros? Sure. Good question. So, um, yeah, first, let me point out that there's sort of two exponentiations going in here, two to the fifth and two to the 32. Uh, this is where the name, the log log part of the, um, of the name hyper log log comes from, is that we have two exponentiations going on here, or conversely, two logarithms going on here. And so the question is, uh, essentially, where are both of these two logarithms coming from? How do we go five bits per register, this exponentiation followed by this exponentiation to get the four billion numbers? So the five bits per register means that the register itself can have any number between zero to 31, any number between um, that, that five bits can, can store in it. The register itself stores how many, the number of leading zeros. So the register stores the number of leading zeros. And so how many, what's the biggest number that we can store in, um, well, it's, if, if we had, if we had 31 leading zeros, so 31 is the biggest number that we can have. Had 31 leading zeros, then what is the cardinality of 
cardinality of our set. I'm going to scroll up just a little bit to this spot right here. And the cardinality of our set, this claim right here, is that if we have n leading zeros, n leading zeros, the cardinality of our data set is going to be 2 to the n, probably an expectation. And so this first, this first exponentiation right here comes from the fact that the register itself stores 2 to the number of bits per register as the number of leading zeros. But then when we count the number of leading zeros into the number of uh, distinct elements, that gets us another, a second exponentiation right there. So it's really an uh, incredibly small amount of bits that we have to store in order to track an incredibly large amount of distinct items. And it's, um, I don't know, in some sense mind-boggling that only five bits can count uh, a billion distinct items. Um, this is a, let's see, in terms of the actual questions, we'll see some examples of the questions that you'll be asked here in a second of what you'll have to calculate. Um, you won't need to know in particular like where these two things uh, come from for the questions, but it, it'll really help in terms of the intuition, make, make it not a, just a mechanical procedure. Um, so no, did that, Connor, answer the question for you? Somewhere? Yeah, um, it kind of leads me to a different question of how does the hash function know how many bits to use to have a unique number for each entry? Yeah, great question. So um, the hash function itself is you basically just need at least whatever number of, um, so if we have five bits per register, then the hash function has to have 32 different uh, bits inside of it in order for us to count the number of leading zeros. And um, so generating good hash functions would be the subject of a cryptography course. And it turns out that if you have a function, a hash function that uh, can generate, say, 10 leading zeros, that same hash function can pretty trivially generate 20 leading zeros or an arbitrary number of, or sorry, that a hash function that outputs something 10 bits, it's pretty trivial to generate a hash function that outputs 20 bits or an arbitrary number of bits. So from like a theoretical analysis perspective, hash functions, we just, we don't really consider how many bits they generate. We just kind of assume that we have an essentially unlimited stream of bits. In practice, all the hash functions that people use, um, 256 bits is what the sort of the minimum number of bits that those hash functions will produce. And that's far more than you need for, um, for something like this, that if you had uh, 256 potentially leading zeros that you're tracking, then that's just some astronomical number out here um, that you could never in practice even store a data set or encounter a data set that's, that's that large. Um, good questions. Any other questions so far? Okay, so that's it for the, the handwritten stuff. Let's switch back over to here. And um, I have two example final questions right here that we will go over here in a second. But first I wanna show us what the, um, this Postgres HLL uh, link, which here we go, this right here. Scroll up to the top. This is just a um, Postgres extension implementing the hyperlog log data structure. It actually implements something uh, a little bit more advanced than hyperlog log. Um, uh, so it's, in some situations, it's able to give you exact counts instead of just approximate counts. There's a lot of details in here that you're welcome to read if you'd like to, but the key thing that we are interested in is this down here explanation of parameters and tuning. And uh, this table down here is um, 
what you'll need to answer the questions. There's two parameters. So again, they're using the word parameters in instead of hyperparameters. Um, I might go back and forth between them, depending on whether I'm reading it or using my internal uh, names. This log two m parameter is the log base two of the m value that we were talking about in the notes. So uh, rather than specifying like 2048, 4096, 256 as the m value, instead you just specify the log of that value. Um, so 10, 11, 12, 13, and so on. And again, 11 is the default value for log 2m. This reg width is the number of bits per register, so the width of the register. And um, again, the default value is 5 for the register width. And so this is the, this right here is sort of the default properties of the HLL um, in Postgres. The way to read this table is at the very top. This is the number of distinct elements that you're able to count. And uh, at the bottom, this is the number of, uh, or the amount of disk space that's going to be used by one instance of the hyperlog log. So here with these parameters, 11 and five, you can count up to um, uh, 10 to the 12th. So is that a, tri a trillion or so different items? And um, uh, it'll only store 1.2 kilobytes of, of disk space. The other um, thing to track is the accuracy of your estimate, and that's given by this formula right here. And uh, we saw that from the, the paper as well, but it's 1.04 divided by the square root of m. So since they're using the log base 2 of m, 2 to the log base 2 of m is what they have in their square root function right here. And so I'll start, we'll use this uh, 11 in log base 2 and plug it in and see what that looks like. Um, I'll use Python for r to do this math here. So import math, oops, import math. And then the formula is 1.04 divided by math dot square root of 2 to the um, uh, 11, like this. And if you do this, this is the uh, standard error that you're going to have on your estimate. So this is a 2% standard error. So um, uh, basically, the, uh, with, with reasonably high probability, all of your estimates are going to be within 2% accuracy of, uh, of the actual distinct number of values. If we needed to say have our estimates within 1% accuracy instead of 2% accuracy, then the way that you would figure out uh, what do you need your M value to be to get you 1% accuracy, just increase this until you get something that's, okay, so now we have something that is strictly less than 1% accuracy when our log base two of M equals 14 or M equals two to the 14. These questions down here are asking things like, so first of all, how much disk space does an HLL with m equals this, reg width equals five consume? So with m equals this, that means the log base two of m would be 11, reg width equals five. Again, these are the default parameters. So just look up in this table, 11, five, 1 1.2 kilobytes of disk space. Simple problem. This one here, is um, a little bit more complex, just uh, thinking about things a little bit in reverse, that how much disk space is needed for an HLL that has less than 1% standard error. So we were saying right here, to get less than 1% standard error, you need your uh, M to be two to the 14th. So log two of M would be 14. And it can count at least 1 billion distinct items. So let's come over here. We find log m2 as 14, and we need to be able to count at least 1 billion distinct items. So that's too small, that's too small, that's too small, that's too small, there we go. That's big enough for us. And so we would need our reg width, again, equal to five in this case, but now we're taking up 10 kilobytes instead of 1.2 kilobytes. And the reason for the increased disk usage is we increased the, uh, 
number of registers that we have. Um, are there any questions on how you would go about answering questions like this for the final exam? Okay. Um, yeah, so again, that's all the material uh, that we'll cover for, uh, for the final in this class. On Wednesday, we'll do a review of, uh, wrap everything uh, up, uh, review some of the key concepts that will be on the final exam, and, and then you'll have a chance to, to ask more questions about things that um, you wanna ask questions about either on Wednesday or, or on Friday during the lab time. That will be the end of class today. I'll stick around and answer any questions that anybody has either on this or the project. Um, but otherwise, I will see you all on Wednesday.